Father in heaven, as we open the Word of God, we pray that you would come and speak to our hearts this morning. Take our minds away from the wanderings of the earth and give us the message from heaven that you've prepared for us this day. In Christ's name, amen. Time for a Bible quiz. You ready for your Bible quiz? How many promises are there in the Bible? How many, pro several. <laughs> How many promises are there in the Bible? 365. There's one for every day of the year. Well, it's more than 365. Somebody said 7,000. It depends on which author you read. Now, let me give you some numbers. The last author I read said there are approximately 8,810 promises in the Bible. In the Old Testament, he counted 7,706. If you question his count, count them. New Testament, 1,104 wonderful promises. Next question in the quiz. What is the chapter in the Bible that has the most Bible promises in it? I see blank looks on the face of my congregation. <laughs> Deuteronomy 28 has 133 promises in it. Our trust is never misplaced when we trust in the promises of God. Since it's impossible for God to lie, he stakes the honor of his throne on his promises. His promises are secure as his throne. His word is as certain as heaven itself. His word is eternally true. And when the challenges of life seem overwhelming to you and to me, we can cling to the promises of God. Frances Havergal was a noted hymn writer. And that she loved the word of God. She loved the God of the word. She was 43 years old and she was dying. Now Frances wrote those great hymns like Take my life and let it be, I gave my life for thee. And she was 43 years old and she was dying. And she asked her nurse to get her Bible and to read Isaiah 42 and verse 6. And if you have your Bible, this is the request of a dying woman who wrote so many of the hymns in our hymnal. And she asked her nurse, go, get my Bible. Read Isaiah 42, verse 6, a marvelous promise of God. And as her nurse read that powerful verse in Isaiah, that wonderful promise, Isaiah 42, verse 6, the nurse read, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Francis said, stop, stop, read it again. Her nurse read, I have, I have called you in righteousness. Francis said, called, I will hold your hand. Holding my hand, I will keep you. And then she made that marvelous statement where she said, and she could hardly speak, she spoke of a, with a whisper, she said, called, holding my hand. Then she said, kept. I can go home on that. I can go home on that. I can go home on the one that calls me. I can go home on the one that holds my hand. I can go home on the one that keeps me. I can go home on that. Within minutes, she closed her eyes in the sleep of death and waits for the resurrection of Christ with the hope in her heart that she was called and that God was holding her hand and that she could go home on that. The Israelites, when they wandered in Egyptian bondage, clung to the promise of God that bondage would not last forever, that the slavery of the Egyptians would not last forever that the oppression of the evil one would not last forever, that one day, based on the promises of God, they would go home. Now, what kind of promises did Israel have when they were wandering in the wilderness? What kind of promises did they cling to? 
although deliverance appeared impossible, although they suffered under the lash of the oppressor, although they didn't have visible evidence at all of relief from bondage, deep within their heart, in their fabric of their beings, they longed for Canaan. They longed for home. They longed for a promised land. And they had nothing but the oppressor's lash. They had nothing but the snap of the whip. They had nothing but bondage and slavery and oppression. But they clung to the promises given to them by the prophets. Isaiah 6, verse 6, rather, Exodus 6, verse 6 and 7. Exodus 6, verse 6 and 7. What kind of promises did the Israelites hang on to in the wilderness? What kind of promises got them through their bondage? What kind of promises kept their faith high in that period of oppression? Exodus chapter 6, we're looking at verses 6 and 7. God says to Israel, they're in the middle of bondage. They are filled with oppression. The Egyptians are pushing them on every hand to work more and more. They're weary, they're tired, their backs are aching. They see no visible signs of deliverance, nothing of Canaan. And Moses says to them in Exodus 6, verse 6 and 7, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I'll rescue you from bondage. I'll redeem you with the outstretched arm and great judgments. I'll take you as my people. I'll be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who brings you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. What a promise. What a God. He's the God that lifts our burdens. He's the God that rescues us from bondage. He's the God that delivers. And when Moses proclaimed this message to the Israelites, they must have been filled with hope. The story of Israel being delivered from the bondage of the Egyptians is the story of the point of salvation. You and I are under the hand of the oppressor. We are in the enemy's land. We have the lash of the tyrant whipping us day by day and beating us into submission. But the promise of God rings true. He is the Jesus that will rescue us. He is the Jesus that will deliver us. He is the Christ that will come in our bondage and free us. He is the one that will take us to the promised land. Now, God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis 15. Notice the precision of the promise. Of course, this is before Israel goes into captivity. But God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. The promises of God are true. Even when those promises seem illogical, even when those promises seem impossible of fulfillment, what God says is so. Even if it doesn't seem to be so, because the God that declares it to be so will make it so. Genesis, you're looking there at Genesis 15, and we're looking at verse 15 and, on, and verse 13 and 14. Then God says to Abram, or Abraham, know certainly that your descendants will be in a stranger's land. In other words, Abraham, you'll have a son, Isaac, and he'll have Jacob, and there'll be 12 sons, and one of them will be Joseph. And Joseph will go down into a foreign land. He's going to be a slave, and your people are going to be slaves. Abraham, I want you to know this, that in generations to come, your people are going to be in bondage. Your people are going to go through oppression. Now notice, God's telling that to Abraham, but look what he says. Know your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. Now God says that generations before it happens. He makes a very precise promise that they will be there only 400 years. What a prediction. Now notice, also, the nation whom they serve, I will judge, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Now, I can imagine that during the 400 years of bondage that Israel clung to that promise, all they had were the promises of God to cling to. There are times in our life where we walk through dark valleys. There are times in our life when we walk through difficult experiences. There are times in our life when the clouds of despair are around us. 
and we have little to cling to except the promises of God. But the promises of God are enough. The promises of God got Israel through their bondage for 400 years. God's promises give us hope. God's promises bring us joy. God's promises put a light in our eyes. God's promises put a smile on our face. Because God's promises are true. The Bible says that the nation, verse 14, whom they serve, God's going to judge, and they're going to come out with great substance. God decreed it, and it came to pass. God promised it, and God made good on his word. God said to Moses, after Moses wandered, a hundred, wandered 40 years in the wilderness, he's over 100 years old, God says, Moses, let my, go down to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people what? Go. Pharaoh was reluctant to do that. And God sent plague after plague on the Egyptians, broke the back of bondage, and Israel left, miraculously delivered. When God miraculously works in your life, deliverance does not mean that there are no difficulties anymore. Miraculous deliverance doesn't mean freedom from difficulties. But even when God miraculously delivers you and begins to lead you in a different direction, he does it in the most merciful way possible. So I'd like to spend some time this morning studying with you the exodus, the point at which Israel leaves Egyptian bondage, comes to the Red Sea, and God opens that sea, and they go through the other time. We're going to study that small slice of Israeli history and say to ourselves, how's God speaking to us through his word in this story? Our story begins in Exodus, the 13th chapter. Exodus, the 13th chapter. Israel has been called from Egyptian bondage. And we start with Exodus 13, beginning with verse 17. The plagues have been poured out upon Egypt. Pharaoh finally has agreed to let people go. The scripture says in Exodus 13, verse 17, Then it came to pass... When Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the land of the Philistines, though that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and turn to Egypt. That's an interesting phrase. Every phrase in this story is incredibly important. The shortest distance between two lines, two, two locations, is not always a straight line. God could have led Israel directly through the land of the Philistines to the promised land. That was the shortest distance. It was a straight line. But there were at least 600,000 Israeli men, not counting women and children. Most estimates are that there were 2 million Israelites. Now, I want you to imagine that. This is not any small group of 15 or 20 people. You've got to take two million people and take them out of Egypt. You've got to feed them in the wilderness. You've got to have water for them there. But in addition to that, these Israelites come out with herds. They come out with cattle. They come out with large amounts of uh, livestock, sheep and goats. Now, God is not going to allow them to experience more than they can handle. He's not going to allow them to do that. I want you to think about them. They're weary from decades of backbreaking work. They're downhearted because of their trials. They're helpless tribe. They don't have weapons, or very few, no weapons of warfare. They're slowed on their journey by the women and the children. They have uh, no formidable army. So they are a, a collection of weary pilgrims of two million. The Philistines are a major army. 
And God knows that if he leads them through the land of the Philistines, the Philistines are going to attack them, decimate them, and take them as slaves again. So God does the most merciful thing possible. And he leads them through the rocky ravines. He leads them through the desert. He leads them through another way. God is leading your life in the most merciful way possible. You say, I'm going through trials. You should see the ones you would have gone through if God wasn't leading you. He's leading you in the most gracious way possible. Now the scripture says, in Exodus chapter 13, verse 19, now the first point in our story is this. When God leads us, we are not free from difficulty. When God leads us, we're not free from trial. Was God leading the Israelites? Did they have evidence of his leading? Did he give them the pillar by day, and the pillar by night, and the cloud by day? Did God do all that? But did, that, but did God's leading mean that they were free from oppression and trial? Not at all. So if you're going through any trials in your life, it does not mean that God is not leading you. It means that he's leading you in the most gracious way possible, in the most merciful way possible, to develop faith in your life and deeper trust in him. Now in Exodus, the 13th chapter, the 19th verse in our story, the Bible says in Exodus 13, let's pick it up, verse 18, so God led the people. If you have a pen and uh, you're circling the word led in your Bible, God's leading them. They have trials, but he's leading them. They have difficulties, but he's leading them. They have challenges, but he's leading them. God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. When they were in the wilderness, was he still leading them? Are you going through the wilderness? Is he still leading you? Sure. And the children of Israel went up in an orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had placed the children, that's Joseph, had placed the children of Israel under a solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones up from here with you. Now this is significant. Joseph is 110 years old when he dies. His body is embalmed in some coffin in Egypt. But Joseph believed that Egypt was not his home. Joseph believed in the promises of God that one day they would be delivered from the hand of the impressor, oppressor. Joseph sensed that Egypt wasn't his home, and he knew that the sojourn in Egypt would be temporary. Joseph's dying cry was this, this world is not my home. Children of Israel, when you leave, don't leave me behind in Egypt. Don't leave my bones here. Don't leave me withering in the sand and the dust of the oppressor's land. When God moves powerfully to deliver Israel, take my bones with you. Don't leave me in the land of Egypt. Take me to Canaan. In a sense, the cry of every believer is a longing for home. I don't want my bones bleaching in some dirty old dusty tomb when Jesus comes. The cry of my heart is, Jesus, take me home. Take me from the land of bondage. Take me from the land of oppression. See, Joseph's cry is the cry of humanity. We're tired of the oppression. We're tired of being beaten down every day. We're tired of the struggles of earth. The cry of the human heart is no more suffering, no more heartache, no more death. The cry of the human heart is no more cancer, no more heart disease. The cry of the human heart is no more bombs that drop that destroy cities. The cry of the human heart is no more famine. The cry of the human heart is no more children with distended bellies, no more AIDS. The cry of the human heart is, Lord, take my bones home. See, Joseph reveals the cry of all humanity. Chapter 14, verse 1. The Bible speaks to us. The Old Testament stories are ancient, but they're ever true. They're old, but they're ever new. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before pi Harith, between Migdal and the sea, Opposite Beth Safin, you shall camp before it by the sea. Now, as many of you know, I'm interested in etymology. Etymology is word study. You look at a word and you say, where'd that word come from? What's the origin of the word? Let me give you an example. Take the word Sabbath. The word Sabbath 
comes from a Hebrew word, Shabbath. The last part of that word, Bath, comes from the word Beth, like Bethlehem. Beth is house of, Lehem is bread. Beth Seda, Beth is house of, Seda is fish. Beth Ezda, Ezda is mercy, and uh, Beth is house of mercy. So Jesus, the bread of life, was born in Bethlehem, the house of the baker. Uh, Jesus called Peter and J James and John by the seaside of Bethsaida, the house of fish, to be fishers of men. Jesus came to Beth Ezda, the house of mercy. So Beth is the last part of Shabbat. The a middle of Shabbat is, is Abba. So house of, dwelling place of, Abba is what? Father. Sha comes from an old Persian word, Sair, aged, eternal, everlasting. So for the Hebrews, the Shabbat was the eternal sign of the aged, everlasting father. See, that's Shabbat. Now, when you come to Pihirath, I looked at commentary after commentary. I checked the Hebrew, nothing significant. Check commentary after commentary, but I knew there has to be something here. What is this uh, Pihirath? I found an old book I had in my library called Ex Gleanings from Exodus by a guy by the name of Andrew Pink. And he goes into some of the old commentaries and they discovered the meaning for the word and here's the meaning of the word, a place of liberty, a place of liberty, a place of liberty, a place of freedom. Now, what's Magdil? What's this Migdal here? That's easier. That's a place of refuge or a fortress. So God takes them from oppression and bondage. He takes them from the lash of the whip of the oppressor. He leads them, even through trial or difficulty, to their piherath, their place of liberty, where they will see his miracles worked in their behalf. That's what God has done for you and me in Christ. He's taken us from a place of bondage. He's taken us from, a, from the oppressor. He leads us through trials and difficulties to our place of liberty, where he works miracles on our behalf, where he's going to open the Red Sea so we can go on to the promised land in Jesus Christ our Lord. For every one of us, Jesus is our place of liberty. Jesus is our place of freedom. Jesus is the one who is the ultimate deliverer. The story of Exodus is your story. It's the story of my story. It's the story of the church, of God leading a people into the promised land. He frees us from the hopeless despair of our oppressor, Satan. And he breaks the bondage. He delivers us when we cannot deliver ourselves. His goal is to get us to the promised land at any cost to ourselves. Now his goal is to be that strong tower, that place of refuge, that sense of liberty to us. Now Israel comes to that place of Piharath, camping at the base of the mountain, just before them, the Red Sea. Pharaoh recognizes that Moses is not going to lead them out into the wilderness for three days of worship. He recognizes that they're gone for good. His army generals and cabinet convince him, if you let them go, Egypt, the mightiest nation in the world, will be filled with embarrassment. You've got to go get them. You've got to bring them back. So Pharaoh leads an army of 600 of his most fierce warlike chariots to go after them and take them back. He gathers other chariots with him, and he has this mighty army of thousands. Now imagine it. Two million slaves wandering in the desert. And they are the armies of Egypt coming to oppress them and bring them back to slavery and back to captivity. As the Bible describes the story, we read it in Exodus 14, verse 3 to 8. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, the wilderness has closed them in. Then I, God says, will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. Now, I am troubled by this expression, the Lord would harden Pharaoh's heart. Why would God want to harden 
anybody's heart. Why would God want to make a person not sensitive to his voice? Let's study the expression of the hardening of the heart in the Bible. What is the hardening of the heart? How does a heart become hardened? And can my heart or your heart be hardened? Let's see if we look can see the deeper meaning of this. We go back to Exodus chapter 8, verse 32, and we're going to look at three passages in Scripture that describe the hardening of the heart. Exodus chapter 8, verse 32. This gives us a little different picture in Exodus 8, verse 32. The Scripture puts it this way. But Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time, also neither would he let the people go. Now, what does it say here? Who hardened his heart? Pharaoh hardened his heart. Can you think of anything more dramatic to get Pharaoh's attention than to bombard Egypt with the ten plagues? Could there be anything more dramatic? You'd think when the rivers turned to blood, when the frogs covered the land, when the flies destroyed the cattle, when the sun scorched the crops, when the darkness covered the land, when the firstborn of all of Egypt was killed, you would really think that Pharaoh would have said, enough, God, I surrender. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart in this passage? Pharaoh hardened his heart. Psalm 95, verse 8. What does God say to you, to me? To, what did God say to Israel? Psalm 95, verse 8. What does it mean to harden the heart? How does the heart get hardened? What does it mean that God hardens the heart? Psalm 95, verse 8. God says to Israel, he's speaking through David, and God says in Psalm 95, verse 8, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion and as in the trial in the day of the wilderness when your fathers tested me and proved me. Israel also hardened their hearts. And God says, do not do what? Harden your hearts. Now, how is the heart hardened? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 explains it. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 is a very clear passage on how the heart is hardened. And we're going to look at verse 12 and 13 to get the picture. Beware, brethren, this is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So how are our hearts hardened? Sin is deceitful. And when we neglect to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he convicts us, our hearts become hardened. When we compromise our integrity and do wrong when we know we ought to do right, our hearts become hardened. When we compromise the convictions that God has placed there in our hearts by his word, and we turn our backs on the word, our hearts become hardened. If I know that the Bible Sabbath is Saturday in any way, I choose my own way. If I know that God is calling me to give my body to him in the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I just turn my back on that. If I allow the deceitfulness of sin to give me pride and arrogance and a critical tongue. You see, every time we compromise, the heart becomes hardened. Now, does that mean that we are negligible for the voice of the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts? Certainly not. God is so merciful, he keeps speaking to us again and again and again. But here's the problem with Pharaoh. He came to the point in his life where he missed hearing, not God whispering to him, but God shouting at him. He missed hearing that God was bringing deep convictions. And the obvious evidence that should have warmed up his heart, that obvious evidence was neglected by God. A compassionate, loving God reaches out to us moment by moment, revealing our grace, revealing his grace. He reveals his mercy 
His forgiveness, His goodness. But our response to God's action determines whether our hearts are hardened or not. Now, sometimes Scripture describes God's permissive will, like He did in Exodus, Pharaoh hardening his heart, Pharaoh's heart being hardened by God. Sometimes Scripture describes God's permissive will as that which God allows us to do, the choices He allows us to make. In other words, an Almighty God allows us to make choices that determine whether our hearts are open and receptive. And in that way, God hardens our heart. God hardens our heart by allowing us to make the choices of what happens in our life. Oh, I pray that my heart would always be sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit. I pray that I would always hear that still, small voice within me that I be sensitive to what God is saying to me in the choices that I make. Now, our passage today tells us five things about faith. Let's look at them. We go back to Exodus, the 14th chapter. The armies of Pharaoh are bearing down on Israel. They hear the thundering hoofs of the chariots' horses. They see the sun dancing off the spears and shields of the Egyptian warriors. And Israel comes to the Red Sea. In the south there are mountains, they can't flee to the south. In the north there's desert. Before them is the Red Sea, and behind them are the Egyptian armies. Our story tells us five things about faith. The first thing it tells us is that faith is required at each step of our journey. That God leads Israel out of Egyptian bondage by faith. God leads them through the wilderness by faith. But faith does not end at the Red Sea. Faith is required in the Christian life at every step of our journey. There will never be a place where I can say, I have arrived, I no longer need faith. Every day, faith is a momentary experience. Exodus, the 14th chapter, the 9th and 10th verse. So the Egyptians pursued them with their horses and chariots. Now notice what Israel does. Israel begins to cry out, verse 11. They say to Moses, because there are no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to the wilderness? You're going to kill us here. We, we, they're going to just capture us. They may bring us back. Many will, be, will die. You should have left us alone, verse 12, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Amazing how quickly we forget. Amazing how quickly we forget. Had God led them miraculously out of Egyptian bondage, was God mercifully leading them but to Perhoreth, the place of liberty? But there, now they have another trial, and what happens? They forget. They forget. One of the greatest ways to maintain faith is to review your life and see how God has led you. And to look back over your life and say, I see step by step by step how God has led me. He is not going to leave me now. The Egyptians are breathing down my throat. It appears that there's no way out or through. The Red Sea is before me. But I praise God by faith. He is mighty, my mighty deliverer. They, it's so easy to forget what God has done for us. It's so easy to forget his abundant blessings. It's so easy to have a complaining spirit under trial. It's so easy to focus on today's problems rather than yesterday's providences. It's so easy to let worry and fear and anxiety overwhelm us rather than live in calm faith grasping the promises of God. Every single one of us have choices to make every day. Will I live by the promises? Will I live clinging to God's goodness and God's mercy? Will I let what's going on around me wither me up and make me a small, complaining person? Or will I soar above that by the faith of God and praising his name? As believers, we're not exempt from trials. But God, through his divine purpose in it all, will strengthen our faith through trials. The first thing about faith, the first lesson about faith this, 
this morning is this. Faith is necessary at every step of the Christian life. There's no time that you and I can say we don't need faith anymore. Second lesson about faith. Faith has to stand still before it'll ever move forward. Faith has to stand still before it ever move forward. Now let's look at here. Exodus, the 14th chapter. We're looking there at verse 13. Moses said to the people, they're all complaining. They're all critical of Moses of leadership. They're all saying we should have stayed back in Egypt. So what does Moses say? Exodus 14, verse 13. He says four things. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which is accomplished for you. For the Egyptians whom you see this day, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Now notice what he says. First he says, do not be afraid. Now the King James Version says, fear not. If you trace the little two words, fear not, through the Bible, they appear again and again and again. In fact, what's God saying? Fear not. Don't worry. Put your anxiety at my feet. I've got this one. Don't worry about it. Fear not is one of those great expressions uttered through Scripture. Fear not is what God said to Abraham in Genesis 15 when he led him from a land that he didn't know to a new land. Fear not is what God said to Joshua. He said, fear not, Joshua, Joshua 8, and do not be dismayed. Fear not is what God said to Gideon's 300 when they had to face the masses. God said to Gideon, fear not. Fear not is what God said through David to Solomon. Fear not is what Jesus said. Remember, Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And remember what Isaiah said? Take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Isaiah. You'll find it here in Isaiah. And uh, Isaiah says it. He says, fear not in what? Be strong. Fear not, Isaiah says, and be strong. Don't you love these fear not expressions in Scripture? Where here, God speaks to his people. And constantly God is saying to his people, don't fear, don't worry. Isaiah 35, verse 4. Isaiah 35, verse 4. God is constantly saying to his people, say to those who are fearful hearted, Anybody fearful hearted here today? And God speaks to you. Say to those that are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come. This applies both to the second coming of Christ, it applies to the first coming of Christ, and it applies to whatever fear you have today. You see, fear is paralyzing. Fear holds us in bondage. Worry is crippling. It consumes our energy. Anxiety saps our vital force. But God speaks to us. He spoke to Israel. God said, fear not. And doesn't the Bible say in 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out what? Fear. We can be secure in Jesus' love. We don't have to live in perpetual fear and be dominated by worry over whether Jesus can deliver us from the bondage of sin and slavery of the evil one. The Egypt of this world may pursue us. The enemies may attack us. The forces of hell may want to destroy us. But Jesus is a mighty Savior. And Jesus says to you today, fear not. Now notice the second thing he says in our text in Exodus 14, 13. What's the second thing God says in our text? God says what? Stand still. What's he saying when he says stand still? Rest in my love. Rest in my care. Take comfort in my compassion. Rejoice in my goodness. Glory in my grace. You will see the salvation of God. Stand still. It's like Jesus saying to you and me, Come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Jesus is saying, I've got this. I've got this. Don't let your stomach... Be tied in knots over this thing. Don't worry about this thing to worry yourself sick. Don't let it paralyze you. Jesus says, stand still. 
Rest in my grace. Rest in my love. I've led you out of Egyptian bondage. I've led you from the lash of the oppressor. I've led you to the borders of the Red Sea. You think I'm going to let you drown now? Stand still, he says. Then notice what he says here. What's the next phrase? The Lord will do what? What's the Lord going to do for us? The Lord is going to fight for us. Look at over there in Exodus 14. The Lord's going to fight for us. I'm so glad that I have a mighty warrior that's going to fight for me. Aren't you glad for that mighty warrior? It says the Lord is going to what? Fight for you. That's verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. Now in my work, I travel a great deal. Aren't you glad when somebody has your back? Very occasionally, I am placed in situations that can be life-threatening. Some time ago, I was asked to go to a country where Americans were being persecuted badly. I was going to be there for about three weeks. It was an extremely difficult time. I had to go by myself. Nobody else could go with me. And at that point, the church felt that they needed to send a small security team ahead. The situation was extremely dangerous. And so a security team went, reviewed the situation. They planned. They knew where the hospitals were when I went into that country. I have not told this story in public one time. They knew where the hospitals were. There was a helicopter waiting to get me out if we needed to get out. I met with the head of the security team, and he said, I'll be with you, but nobody will know I'm here. If I tap you on your shoulder, you're in big time trouble. I've got to get you out of here quickly. Every morning I met to get a security briefing on what was going on. There were times that it was very, very, very difficult. I knew in that instant that if trouble came, which it well could have, that I was going to get out of there quickly. I knew that there was somebody that had my back. I knew that I could relax and do what I was sent to that country to do without... I knew God was with me. I knew 10,000 angels were with me. But boy, it was nice to have a few visible people around. <laughs> you say, where was your faith? It was in the God who sent those people to be around me. <laughs> That's where my faith was. But I will tell you something. It is a wonderful thing to know you're not alone. It's a wonderful thing to know that God's going to fight your battles for you. You're not alone. You've got the best bodyguard in the world. Jesus sent him as your guardian angel. And he never leaves you and never forsakes you. You've got a wonderful Savior who has his eye upon you, who knows every trial and difficulty you go through. We've got a Lord that says, I will fight your battles for you. I've got your back. And you need not fear. Now, you remember, too, the third thing I wanted to share with you about faith is this. God said to them, Stand still. The Lord's going to fight for you. Then what did he say? He said, hold your peace. Remain calm. Don't go running off on your own. Your efforts are not going to accomplish this. Your strength is insufficient for battle. Jesus says, trust me. But there's another thing about faith, and it's this. Faith moves forward without having all the answers. You see, the answers come as we move forward. Faith moves ahead not because it sees the solution, but because it has absolute confidence in the God who has the solution. There's a marvelous statement in Patriarchs and Prophets that says this, the obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a doubting spirit. Unbelief whispers, let us wait till the obstructions are removed and we can see our way clearly. But faith courageously urges in advance, hoping all things, believing all things. I love that one sentence, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 290. The obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a halting, doubting spirit. Moses leads Israel down toward the sea, and they step in the waters before they part. If you wait to step out for God, 
before every difficulty is removed, your lack of faith will keep them from the waters from parting. I have people tell me, well, Pastor Mark, I want to make a decision for Christ, but, you know, I got this problem or that problem. Or I, want to, I want to keep Sabbath, but I got this problem or that problem. I want to be faithful and tithe, but I got this problem or that problem. You keep waiting, and you're going to have the problems forever. As long as the devil sees you not move and make the decision you want to move, make, those problems are going to come up. But when you step out in faith, by the grace of the living God, he'll part those waters for you. When you move ahead to do what God places in your heart to do, God opens the waters of the Red Sea. You know, if we would have waited to build this building until we had all the money in our hand, you'd still see a piece of dirt on here. We had to step out in faith on a $4 million project when we had $50,000. Well, first we had nothing, then we had $50,000. God calls you when God puts a dream in your heart, when God puts a conviction in your soul, when God moves upon your spirit to do something for Him. First you stand still, in his presence and bathe in his goodness and be strengthened by his might. But there comes a time that you step out by faith. There comes a time that you move forward for Jesus and know that he is going to open that sea for you. Now, faith trusts God at times, number four, when trust seems illogical. Faith is not sight and sight is not faith. When Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and God said to him, move forward, that was the most illogical thing possible. That's what faith is all about. Faith is not sight, and sight is not faith. Moses endured seeing him who is what? Invisible. Faith is believing. Faith is trusting. Faith is clinging to the prom promises of God when you cannot see. Do I understand fully everything about the plan of salvation and how a loving God is going to save a sinner like me? No but I believe. Do I understand how Jesus can not only save me by his grace, but transform me into his likeness? No, but I believe. Do I understand how God will take us through the crisis ahead with the evil forces ripping this world apart and take us safely home? No, but what? I believe. Do I understand how God will open the heavens and deliver us from the bondage of evil and take us through the clouds of glory? No, but I believe. Do I understand how we'll never get bored through the ceaseless ages of eternity? No, but what? I believe. Why? Because of the promises of God. When guilt fills your heart, not only because of what you've done, but what you, because of what you have not done, for all the neglect in your life, and when you see yourself standing before God, trembling and saying, how can I ever be saved? You can still believe. Believe that he's your savior. Believe that you're redeemed by his grace. Believe you're justified by his blood. When you say, God, how are you ever going to get me ready for the second coming of Christ? I know so many deficiencies in my life. You may see yourself, but you can still believe in his grace and his power what he can do. When you see evil triumphing in the world, you believe. Moses said to Israel, move forward in faith. It's time to believe in the promises of God, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, his love, and power. It's time to believe, move forward. Now, one last thing about faith. Faith claims the victory before it experiences the victory. Faith claims the victory. There are many people that can sing the doxology when everything is going well. The most important people in any church are the positive people. People believe God is moving in that church because when you believe it, God does it. When you believe that the church is disunified, it's going to be disunified. But when you believe you've got wonderful people, different backgrounds, different cultures, different understandings, but that God is melding them together into a movement, a fraternity of love, a fellowship of believers that is going to move Northern Virginia for Christ. God does it because we believe it. We see it in our mind, and God accomplishes it in reality. And I will tell you something. This church has been raised up by destiny by God. 
And God's going to do something in Northern Virginia through this group of believers. You are not here by accident. God didn't bring you here for nothing. God's going to open up the Red Sea before us. And there will be churches planted throughout Northern Virginia because of the way God uses you. God, faith claims the victory. Faith rejoices in what God has done in the past because of what he's going to do in the future. Many years ago, George Mueller, that giant of faith who built orphanages throughout Bristol, England, fed thousands of young orphans. Mueller was traveling through from England. He was traveling through the North Atlantic, came up through the Atlantic Ocean, and he was going to an appointment that he had made in Newfoundland. And Mueller had prayed about this appointment a great deal, and he really believed that God had opened the doors for this appointment. And as they were about three days in this old steamer from shore, a dense fog came in, and the boat couldn't move. So Mueller went to the captain. He said, Captain, look, I really, um, I really want to be sure that the boat's going to get there within the next three days because I have an appointment to speak. And the captain said, no way, absolutely impossible. Mueller says to the captain, Captain, then I'm going to have to find another means of transportation because I know God wants me to be there. The captain said, look, I don't know what you're talking about, but this ship is not going to be there. Mueller says, let's go down to the chart room and pray. Now, I want to read you what the captain, the captain recorded this story later. He said, I looked at that man of God and I thought to myself, what lunatic asylum could that man have come from? I never heard of such a thing. Mr. Mueller, I said, do you know how dense the fog is? No, he replied. My eye's not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. <laughs> Captain, he got down on his knees and prayed one of the most simple prayers. I muttered to myself, that would suit a children's class where the children were not more than eight or nine years old. The burden of his prayer was something like this. Oh, Lord, if it's consistent with thy will, please remove this fog in five minutes. You know the engagement you made for me, God, in Quebec on Saturday. is going to Quebec here. And I believe it's your will. Captain, when he finished, I was going to pray. But he put his hand on my shoulder and told me not to pray. First, he said, you don't believe God's going to answer anyway. Secondly, I believe God has already answered. There's no need, for whatever, for you to pray about it. I looked at him, and Mueller said, Captain... I knew my Lord for 47 years. There's never been a single day that I failed to gain an audience with the king. Get up, Captain, and open the door, and you'll find that the fog is gone. I got up, and the fog was gone. <laughs> now, you tell some people that, the captain says, to some scientific mind, and they'll say, that's not according to natural laws. No, the captain says, but it's according to spiritual laws, because the God whom you were served was omnipotent. The God that led the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage and delivered them from oppression and led them as mercifully and graciously as he could through the trials of life is your God. The God that opened the Red Sea is your God. The God that saved the children of Israel and led them into the Canaan land is your God. He is the Christ that forgives us. He is the Christ that delivers us from the lash of the oppressor. He is the Christ that takes the burdens off our shoulders. He is the Christ that works in our life to break the bondage of sin. He is the Christ that takes us through to the promised land. This is our Jesus. Wherever you are in the journey of faith, He's going to take you through. Wherever you are in your wilderness wanderings, if you believe and trust him, he's going to take you through. Whatever Red Sea stands before you that appears impossible to open, this God, this God, 
is going to open that sea for you to the glory of his name. And one day in Canaan land, we'll sing his praises forever and ever and ever. God fights our battles for us. Let's stand and sing of this God who fights the battles for us. Faith is the what? Faith is the what? Victory that does what? Overcome the world. together. Father, we bow our heads in quietness. There may be somebody here that they're going through a real challenge with their faith. The Red Sea is before them. The enemy is pouncing upon them. But today, they just want to lift their hand and say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you're going to fight my battles. I believe you're going to take me through this difficulty. Lord, I'm extending my hand up right now in faith as pastor prays for me. Would you just lift your hand in faith? You're going through some difficulty, some challenge, and God's going to deliver you. You may put your hand down. Is there somebody here that you've looked at your past and you feel condemned by it? Not only by what you've done, but by what you haven't done. And you want to walk out of here with peace, knowing that Jesus says to you, my child, I am leading you. Move forward in your life. Don't linger in the past. You want Jesus to give you calm in that experience. Would you just lift your hand? You may put it down. Is there somebody here today that you are struggling with something that maybe nobody else knows about, but it's kind of tying you up in bondage 
and you need deliverance by the living Christ, would you just raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the quietness of this moment, you are speaking to hearts. In the quietness of this moment, you are moving. Where there are red seas before us, and the enemy is lashing us, help us know that Jesus will fight our battles. Help us walk out of this place filled with hope. Where we've failed in the past, forgive us. Not only for what we've done, but for what we should have did. Father, help us know that you're a mighty Savior, that your grace is for us. Send us from this place today with that assurance. And Lord, where our dispositions are not sweet and kind, where our tongues often don't speak words of hope, where our attitudes are not right, where the habits of our life tie us up in bondage, send us from this place with that Red Sea open today. Send us from this place trusting the living Christ. We believe, Father, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. We believe, not because we are worthy, because you are. Lead us through the Red Sea to the promised land. We cry out with Joseph. We long to be in that promised land. Don't leave our bones in the dust of the earth, but take us home to glory, we pray thee in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Go and take on the world. In Jesus' name.